Good evening. My name is Tim Neff, and I'm a Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's program, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the, to the program this evening. One of Pittsburgh's most well-known um, most well-known landmarks, basically, is Soldiers and Sailors, which is a nonprofit organization which stands a unique memorial dedicated to honoring the men and women of all branches of service from all generations of conflicts. Our vast collection of artifacts provides a unique look into American military history by telling the stories of individuals who served our country. Artifacts displayed within the hallways explore such themes as what American service personnel wore, carried, and brought home with them, and it all allows visitors to better understand the American military experience. I would like to welcome you to our Spotlight On program and thank everyone for virtually joining us this evening. For more information about our Spotlight On programs, which take place on the second Thursday of each month, you can visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org. The format of tonight's program will be a panel discussion. Let me point out that at the end of the discussion, there will be time for question and answers. If you have a question, please submit a comment on Facebook, or if you're watching on YouTube, please email your question to soldiers and sailors Pittsburgh at gmail.com, which you see on the screen now. This June marks the 77th anniversary of the commencement of the Battle of Normandy during World War II, which lasted from June 1944 to August 1944 and resulted in the Allied liberation of Western Europe from Nazi Germany's control. Codenamed Operation Overlord, the battle began on June 6, 1944, which is also known as D-Day, when some 156,000 American, British, and Canadian forces landed on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of France's Normandy region. The invasion was one of the largest amphibious military assaults in history and required extensive planning. Prior to D-Day, the Allies, conduct Allies conducted a large-scale deception campaign designed to mislead the Germans about the intended invasion and target. By late August 1944, all of Northern France had been liberated, and by the following spring, the Allies had defeated the Germans. The Normandy's landings have been called the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. Tonight, we will learn about this region's contributions to this historical event that changed the course of the war. We are excited to welcome Jared Frederick, who will share accounts from his book, Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Evasion, a sweeping narrative which paints an eloquent portrait of soldiers and civilians dramatically affected by what Dwight Eisenhower called the Great Crusade. After that, we will welcome Michael Krauss, who will share stories associated with artifacts from the museum's collection that have, connect, that have a connection to D-Day. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Jared Frederick. Jared has a lifelong passion for American history. His many books include Gettysburg National Military Park, Dispatches of D-Day, and Hang Tough, the World War II letters and artifacts of major Dick Winters. Prior to, this, uh, prior to his current position as an instructor of history at Penn State Altoona, Frederick served as a park ranger at Gettysburg National Military Park and Harpers Ferry National Historic Park. Jared has also acted as a talking head in a number of films and documentaries, and in 2019, he was a guest host on Turner Classic Movies for the channel's 25th anniversary. Frederick is available to present a broad range of historical lectures and presentations, and you can always visit jaredfrederick.com to learn more. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jared. Thank you, and I'm very glad to be here for this special anniversary of the Normandy invasion. We can go ahead and start going into my PowerPoint slide. All right, thank you. Every American town has a D-Day story. And that was one of the prevailing things that I discovered amidst my research in writing Dispatches of D-Day, a people's history of the Normandy invasion. And in my view, D-Day was the biggest news story in American history. It was bigger than the Kennedy assassination. It was bigger than the moon landing. It was bigger than September 11th. And the reason why that was so is because everybody knew somebody who was directly involved in it. And there are few other events in American history that can claim such notoriety in that regard. This was especially so for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
And there are a number of different elements or spheres that we could look at as we take into consideration Pittsburgh's D-Day history. As we look at Pittsburgh itself, of course, this was a, a thriving industrial metropolis that was fundamental to the Allied war effort, the production of steel, landing craft, copper, everything imaginable. Uh, we can also, you know, take into consideration all of these social and cultural elements, too. Uh, how did the people of Pittsburgh react to news of the Normandy invasion? How did Pittsburgh play a crucial role in the civil rights movement at this moment? These were the sometimes surprising things that I was encountering as I was writing my book. Um, and then there are the other, uh, you know, uh, less notable, that, but nonetheless interesting uh, things. Uh, for instance, uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates game that was scheduled for that evening was postponed because who wanted to watch a baseball game or listen to a baseball game as their sons and husbands were storming the beaches of Normandy? And so some of the stories that we're going to look at tonight will take us to the front lines and we'll go ahead and move on to our next slide here as we start to look at some of these stories. I looked at 150 different newspapers from Maine to Oregon as I was researching my book. And of course, among those, very notably, was the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette amongst uh, many other newspapers that were located in operating out of Western Pennsylvania. And uh, this, by and large, structurally speaking, is how most American newspapers looked on Tuesday, June 6th, 1944. As big a font as could possibly be imagined, streaming across the front banners, a very generic map of Northwestern Europe and these very uh, broad overviews of what the beginning of the invasion portended in addition to Dwight D. Eisenhower's D-Day command of the day, a very notable two-minute speech that he delivered. And as we move to our next slide, uh, we can begin to delve into some of the personal stories that uh, later uh, kind of drifted back to the home front. And this, too, is something really surprising that, that I found in my research, because constantly, you know, we are given this perception that uh, wartime letters were very much censored, uh, that soldiers and sailors and airmen were not permitted to talk about their experiences in any sort of depth or detail to their loved ones back home. And I found that not really to be the case at all, uh, going through these thousands upon thousands of firsthand accounts. And among those Pittsburgh natives, uh, who were involved in this great crusade uh, was a paratrooper from the 101st Airborne Division whose name was Charles Bray. Uh, his friends and his families lovingly referred to him as Jakey. And in mid-July of 1944, uh, Jakey Bray wrote home a very in-depth account of the, the, the trials and the tribulations that he and his fellow paratroopers had to endure in the earliest hours of D-Day as they were dropped behind enemy lines. And he also chronicled what happened in the days that followed. Uh, but speaking of a scene much like the one that we see depicted here in the background, uh, Bray wrote home, we could see the red and green tracers following us. So most of us grabbed our shoot risers and pulled down. That made us fall twice as fast. It was about 1 a.m., but I could see. I was almost to the ground, so I reached for my trench knife and started cutting myself out of my chute. I was halfway out when I hit the ground. And in these words, we can see a paratrooper who was rough and ready to go. Uh, he was a, a highly mobile trooper who was prepared to fight as soon as he struck the ground. And about a week later, uh, he would be fairly seriously wounded as his division moved on to uh, the French crossroads town of Carentan as Allied troops were attempting to link up the beachheads. And so here we have an eyewitness account from the earliest moments of D-Day. 
as we move on to our next soldier here in our uh, next slide, um, there's another Pittsburgher uh, who was from the Shady Side area uh, of Pittsburgh, and his name was Charles Schmelz. And Schmelz was a member of the United States Army Air Forces. And he was one who was not very inclined to be sitting on the sidelines as all of these thousands of paratroopers and glider men were uh, embarking on this daring mission across the English Channel. And uh, perhaps at the very last minute, uh, Schmelz decided that he wanted to go too, that he did not want to be left behind and he didn't want to miss any of this action. And therefore, uh, he smuggled himself away in the rear compartment of a glider, much like we see here. And these gliders uh, were engineless aircraft uh, that were uh, pulled by a tow line um, by a C-47 aircraft that would be to their front. And uh, these planes would uh, untether themselves from their aircraft that were pulling them, and then they would land in the, the dense Normandy countryside. Um, about 20 minutes into this flight, uh, the glider men who were uh, aboard this aircraft uh, heard this knocking from the back compartment. And once they opened it, uh, Private Schmelz um, emerged. Um, and they thought, well, we certainly can't take him back, so we're just going to have to make the most of this. And he ended up fighting with them. And in fact, uh, he, he distinguished himself in a, in a very heroic way. Um, under enemy machine gun fire, he uh, essentially crawled out into the middle of no man's land and uh, re retrieved a bundle of supplies uh, that had landed, that landed there in that boggy terrain. And uh, he wrote of this in, in hindsight. Uh, that was some deal for doing more in three days in France than I have done in two years in the States and England. Now, for as heroic as this may have been, uh, for Schmelz, it, it ended up uh, gaining him punishment rather than promotion uh, because he went AWOL uh, to go on this joyride with uh, these glider-borne troops. And uh, he uh, was fined $20. Um, he was suspended for 30 days, and he had to spend eight days in the guardhouse. Uh, but in Schmelz's mind, it was completely worth it because he finally felt like he had stepped up and done something. So a very colorful story of a Pittsburgh guy that we see here. Next slide, please. Um, among uh, troops that, that I have a lot of affinity for are the men of the 4th Infantry Division. Uh, my grandfather, who was a uh, railroader from Altoona, uh, served with this division and went ashore on Utah Beach with these guys uh, shortly after 6.30 on D-Day. And um, among uh, the many Pittsburgh troops who were serving in this division at that time uh, was a young man by the name of Walter Janicki. And uh, he, too, wrote this very vivid account of what uh, he and his fellow soldiers uh, had to endure in those early hours. And uh, he recalled this about Utah Beach. He said, one thing I'll never forget about the beach is going back to get a buddy I knew had been hit. It was after I got the pillbox. So he took out a, a German fortification here is what he's saying. But I don't want you to print that, uh, print who or, you know, what he looked like. You know, he was talking to a reporter as he was saying this. And 88 had hit him bad. But you can print that I've lost half my hair. I'm not like some of the guys about things like that. And I stutter now, too, but I'm not ashamed of it. And print that. Um, and so here is a young soldier who had obviously witnessed and endured some fairly substantial psychological trauma. He lost his friend's die. He lost his hair. He started stuttering as a result of the combat fatigue uh, that he had endured. And it really puts... A, a human face uh, to, to the level of the sacrifice and suffering that a lot of these GIs had to go through. Um, this also speaks of, of something else that is very important uh, that I found quite often in Stars and Stripes, the widely read military newspaper of that time. And soldiers had an expectation 
of the free press. You know, the free press was one of the reasons why they were fighting this war. Soldiers loved reading newspapers and magazines. But when they acted heroically in combat, there was an expectation that their deeds should be reported so other soldiers could read about it, so that people back home could likewise read about it. And when they weren't reported, when those stories weren't conveyed to the American public, GIs certainly had something to say about it. And so little wonder why so many of these tales end up in the pages of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Next slide, please. I think one of Pittsburgh's most important contributions in regard to advancing the ideas of morality, justice, and notions of democracy was best delivered through the efforts of the Pittsburgh Courier, which was one of the most widely read African-American newspapers in the United States at that time. And if memory serves correctly, it had a subscription rate of about 250,000, uh, which is very substantial for 1944 America. And the Pittsburgh Courier initiated what became known as the Double V Campaign. And in essence, what that predicated is that once Black Americans can help attain victory overseas, they will be able to return home, and through their gallant deeds, they will have proven that they were worthy of the full rights of citizenship that they and their ancestors had long been denied. After all, this was a segregated military, and it would remain so for another four years following D-Day. And one of the, the sad facts of the matter was is that many African-American troops who were stationed in England prior to the invasion felt more at home overseas than what they did in their own country, a country um, in Great Britain where there was no color line, there was no Jim Crow. And as one African-American veteran later recalled, we black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. And this became a rather unexpected element of my D-Day research. I did not expect this chapter of American history to become a shining moment uh, yet another uh, moment of inspiration for the civil rights movement. And as we move on to our next slide here, I'd like to share some words from the Pittsburgh Courier that underscore this very important point. Um, this was written by uh, the Pittsburgh Courier two days after D-Day, and it puts forth a very good argument. It says, on the Normandy beachhead on D-Day, whom did the white soldier from Georgia or Florida fear the more? The armed Negro beside him or the German who is white like himself? This war is being fought not against Negroes, but against other white people. And the Negroes who have the least to lose are giving a cheerful helping hand. Yet here in America, German prisoners are being served in restaurants from which Negro soldiers are barred, all just because of the Germans' skin color. Even in England, the mother of the color line has abolished Jim Crow in her army. And you know who can argue against a logic like that? Um, you know, there was this very real expectation that the one million African Americans who were in service, whether it be in Europe or the Pacific, uh, had something that was owed to them. Um, and indeed, as we look at the subsequent history of the 1950s and the 1960s and all of these thoughts of blossoming into a bigger civil rights movement, um, surprisingly enough, we can look back on June 6, 1944 as yet another starting point in these very significant conversations in American history. Next slide, please. I've had the pleasure of meeting one such African-American veteran uh, who is from the Pittsburgh area, and uh, his name is Henry Parham. And Mr. Parham was a veteran of the 320th Anti-Aircraft Barrage Balloon Battalion. And uh, there's a, a wonderful book uh, that came out uh, just a few years ago called Forgotten, which looks at this segregated unit in Europe and the various struggles that they had to overcome. Uh, this picture of, of me in GI uniform uh, and him was taken on the 75th anniversary of D-Day um, in Pittsburgh. 
And to my knowledge, this 99-year-old veteran um, is the last surviving African-American veteran who actually stepped foot on the shores of Normandy on D-Day. Um, and so um, this gentleman is a Pittsburgh treasure um, of, of the highest order. And uh, like so many of his generation, he is so um, humble and honorable um, about his service. And there's so much yet that we can learn from gentlemen like him. Next slide, please. And uh, if, if you click one more time there, we can take into consideration some of Dwight Eisenhower's thoughts about D-Day all of these years later in 1964, when he and CBS News journalist Walter Cronkite returned to Normandy. And as Eisenhower, who is now in the final years of his life and uh, the presidency and his generalship was behind him, uh, looking out over that cemetery, he said, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray that humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And these are so important words for us to consider three quarters of a century later. And uh, it begs the question to this very day, what are we going to do with the chance that this generation granted us these 77 years ago? And uh, finally, on our last slide here, as we wrap things up, uh, just a, a quick plug for my books if you're interested in learning more. Um, many of these stories of D-Day Pittsburgh can be found in my book, Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion, um, as well as uh, many other towns and what people were feeling and thinking and how they were acting both at home and overseas. Um, my more recent book, which looks at uh, another Pennsylvanian, uh, another Pennsylvania officer in the form of Dick Winters, is called Hang Tough. Uh, which looks at the correspondence of that iconic officer who was so notably portrayed in the Band of Brothers. Um, I hope at some point I can uh, come out to Soldiers and Sailors Hall um, in person as the world continues to get healthier, um, but this was a fine substitute in the meantime, and I'm really grateful for having the opportunity to talk with all of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. That was wonderful. Really appreciate you joining us this evening as well. And we certainly look forward to welcome you to our museum someday. So you can see us in person and uh, meet us in person and get to look at all our wonderful artifacts, which you're about to hear from next here in a moment. Before I turn it over to our next presenter though, I'd like to remind everybody um, that if you have a question for Jared or eventually Michael here, um, you can always post a comment on Facebook or email. If you're watching on YouTube, you can email Soldiers and Sailors Pittsburgh at gmail.com. And now it is time to move on to our next presenter, Michael Krauss. Uh, and as a well-known Civil War historian, Michael currently works as the curator and historian for Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. His accomplishments include several historical consultant credits for major films, writing and narrating the documentary series Civil War Minutes and Civil War Life, as well as authoring articles and books regarding the conflict. Michael also is an accomplished sculptor with an impressive resume of historically themed book works in bronze. Michael is going to talk about some of the artifacts that we have in our collection here at Soldiers and Sailors that are related to today's topic about D-Day. Thank you so much, Michael. Michael, you'd have to unmute your mic there, please. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Jared. Um, and thank you, Tim, but thank you, Jared for the wonderful presentation and the work you've done uh, in your writing and teaching and uh, lifetime devotion to history. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from you for a long time and with so many, so many good opportunities and products. I'm gonna talk tonight, I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna kind of take off on where Jared was, uh, but I'm gonna use artifacts from our collection at Soldiers and Sailors. And we have a lot of pieces that are D-Day related. And I've chosen a few that are particularly poignant and tell the story because I believe that it, when you look at an artifact, you can it helps you to visualize the person that touched it or used it or, or what happened uh, with that particular artifact. So let's go to our first one. 
this is a uh, this tattered flag. Um, in most instances, you know, we revere the flag, and once they're damaged, we uh, very thoughtfully uh, dispose of them. But this one, the damage to this flag tells its own story. It was a flag that flew from the uh, shroud lines of uh, landing craft at, at uh, Normandy on June 6, 1944. It was LCI 540. Now the landing craft um, came across uh, with uh, with its crew of uh, of soldiers to be dropped off. Um, they lowered their Higgins boats. The soldiers got in and uh, and made their way to the beach. LCI 540 contributed its soldiers to the second wave. And um, when it dropped soldiers off, it uh, the from the beach, other soldiers were returning. Wounded soldiers were returning and they boarded LCI 540 and were taken back to England and, and uh, 540 came back with another load of soldiers. And that happened uh, 22 times. Uh, she made 22 voyages in the um, days of the Normandy landing. And this flag flew from the shroud. So you see the damage that's happened to the edge of the flag. Um, it's actually, if you could see it in person, has uh, diesel smoke and, and stains on it. It came to us directly from, um, it had been given to the captain and then the captain had given it to a crew member. So it's, uh, we have a very good line of provenance. And just looking at this flag again, conjures up that very day that uh, it flew from the shrouds on D-Day on June 6, 1944. The next slide, please. This is one of the, uh, I, I think one of the major pieces that we have at Soldiers and Sailors, um, not only for D-Day, but in, in our entire collection. We're lucky enough to have seven medals of honor from different soldiers from our region. And one of them was presented to John Joseph Pinder. John Joseph Pinder was uh, in the first division, 16th Infantry which was one of the first infantry regiments to hit the beaches of Omaha Beach. Uh, Pinder was a radio operator. He had already seen combat in Italy with the 1st Division, so this is nothing new to him. He's a little bit older than most of your soldiers. In fact, June 6, 1944 was his 32nd birthday. So you, you wonder what must have been running through his mind at that point in time. But as, as his boat approached the the shore and the gate dropped down, they were hit by German machine gun fire. Pinder was towards the rear of the, of the load of men uh, and he jumped over the side of the ship. And when he landed, as he was doing that, a uh, bullet ricocheted off the, the vessel and tore a part of his face. Uh, some, some witnesses said he was holding the left side of his face on with his hand. So he's already badly wounded. He's in salt water up to his chest. He's carrying a radio that weighed as much as a window air conditioner. If you've ever picked up an air conditioner and felt what it weighs, imagine that strapped to your back and you're jumping into the water and you're already wounded. Well, there, there's another element to this story. And that is that Pinder was an athlete. He had actually had a, a minor league contract uh, in, the, uh, in, a, in a team in Cleveland. Uh, so he's, he's gonna be, uh, athletically motivated. So when he hits the water, has that radio on his back, he's going he's gonna to move and he's going to make his way to the beach. He does. He gets up on the beach. He takes his radio off. He starts to assemble it, finds that pieces are missing or broken. Uh, so he decides to get up and make another trip back on the beach to see if he can find another radio because obviously there were other men who had been hit and perhaps one of them had a radio. And he indeed does find a radio on a fallen soldier. He manages to pick it up. And in that act, he, he gets hit by machine gun fire across both legs. So now he's wounded in the legs and in the face. He makes his way to the crest of the beach. Um, he refuses medical aid. There, there are several people who notice this and you know are trying to, to get him help. He refuses medical aid. He manages to put the radio together and get it working. And just as it got working, he was hit in the head by a sniper and killed. So Pinder does not survive June 4th. He's killed there. But um, like Jared said, um, the, some, of these, some of these men uh, wanted to be noticed. 
And I don't know whether he wanted to, but he was. He, and in because he was noticed, he uh, he was nominated for a Medal of Honor, which he would receive. Now, what you see here is something very interesting. First of all, his portrait in the box that the Medal of Honor came in. We also have the medal you can see in our Hall of Valor. But on the right-hand side of this slide are the contents of his wallet that he had with him on June 6, 1944. And how do we know that? Well, first of all, uh, when he was buried, uh, very efficiently, the uh, burial details recorded uh, what was on his person and, and things that they could return to the family, they did. And this wallet is listed in his personal effects and was returned to the family. Unfortunately, they threw away the leather wallet because they thought it was damaged, and uh, but they did keep the contents. And in them, we get a very personal look at this brave young man and what he what his thoughts must have been. On the left, a picture of his father. His mother had passed away a few years before. There are some, um, he was a radio operator, so there's some uh, code sheets, uh, calendar for 1944, um, some pictures of, of girls in bathing suits. He's a young man. Let's let's give him that. The picture in the center bottom is his brother Hal, who was a B-24 uh, pilot who had been shot down earlier that year. And uh, Joe, John Joseph Pinder, didn't know whether Hal, his brother, had survived, but he carried his picture with him. And um, and this is one of the things in his wallet. And we've only recently learned. Um, through a friend of the family, uh, that th you notice there's a, a playing card on the top, a Queen of Hearts, and I just assumed it was a lucky card. But we we just recently learned that that card may signify or symbolize his brother's plane because it was called Sky Queen. And again, it was a B-24. So uh, John Joseph Pinder is killed. His brother did survive the crash of his B-24 and was in a German prison camp and would not learn his his younger brother's fate till after the war ended and he was released. So this is a fabulous story and one of our, our, our most moving stories, um, again, that not only encompasses D-Day, but, but a Medal of Honor recipient and much more. So could we move to the next slide? I know a lot about John Joseph Pinder and I know very little about uh, Private Frank Burdett Miller, other than on this photograph uh, was written his name and it said uh, killed on Omaha Beach in pencil on the back. And it came from a family. Uh, it was a it was a cousin of theirs. And uh, this young man, uh, maybe eight, 17, 18 years old, was one of the casualties uh, on Omaha Beach. And I, I keep uh, this photograph on my desk. Uh, so I see it every day and remember Private Frank Burdett Miller and um, his death that was too early and his sacrifice on Omaha Beach. Next. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a photograph of a paratrooper. Um, his name is Charles Liebreth. He uh, was a, an immigrant. Uh, he immigrated with his family from Germany. He was just a small boy when he came over. Uh, they spoke German in the house. Uh, and when he went to school, uh, grade school, he had a, he had a German accent, and the kids made fun of him. But he he overcame this, and uh, by the time of uh, Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, he enlisted right away. He wanted to be uh, to fight for his country. Uh, he was a paratrooper in the 505th Paratroop Infantry, 80, 82nd Airborne. He jumped. Um, the night of uh, uh, very early in the morning of June 6th uh, in St. Mary Glees. He uh, fought his way for a few days uh, towards the, uh, uh, toward uh, their, their, uh, their objectives in France. Um, and on, um, I believe it was June 8th, he was in some hedgerows with some other soldiers and a German artillery shell uh, hit, the, hit the hedgerows very close to him. Um, he was wounded badly. He, he did. He did survive his wounds, but he would be out of the war from that moment on. Uh, after he recovered, the end of the war in Pittsburgh, became a school teacher, and then he uh, entered into uh, state government and was a, a public servant uh, for many years afterwards. Next, please. 
And if you notice the jacket that Charles Liebreth was wearing, this is not uh, not his jacket, but it's a, a jacket uh, of a member in the same 505th uh, 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 regiment, but this is a field artillery uh, soldier in the 82nd Airborne named Bill uh, Swayzik. And the jacket is unique. This is a, a, a paratrooper jacket. Uh, it's a, a cotton jacket with slash pockets um, and um, it has a zip up and buttoned uh, front. In the very top by the collar is a little opening where they kept a, a, a knife where they could reach uh, the knife easily and cut their lines of their parachute once they landed. Uh, the, the jacket also had, um, or not the jacket, but the uniform also had canvas trousers with big giant cargo pockets and uh, very, very suited for the landing and very iconic of the paratroopers from the 101st and 82nd Airborne that jumped in. Now, the uniforms um, were were somewhat worn through the rest of the war, but being cotton and, and also when they got wet, they got heavy and, and cold. So they were not uh, reissued. They, uh, the two regiments used the surplus that was uh, available to them. And after that, um, they, they uh, were not issued any longer. So these are quite rare and, and we have uh, we have several of them, um, two from the 82nd, one from the 82nd Airborne, and we just acquired one from the 101st Airborne, and we have another one from the 11th Airborne in our collection. Next, please. Here we have um, another member of the um, 82nd Airborne. It just happens that he was also in the 505th Parrot, uh, uh, um, Paratroop Infantry Regiment. Uh, the 82nd Airborne, and um, his name was, uh, his last name was Shell. And uh, what we have here is his uh, Eisenhower jacket. And uh, this was given to us by his son, um, who said his father never talked about what happened. Uh, but, but looking at his uniform and looking at his decorations and um, things that he's showing us on, on the uniform, uh, we can tell that uh, he indeed was uh, was at Normandy and was actually um, in the entire war. Now, looking at the uniform on the left, we see uh, Shell's picture, and on his uh, on the left side, which is his right breast pocket, is his combat infantry badge. Above that, a presidential unit citation, which was given to the 101st, the 82nd, and the uh, Rangers. Uh, it was a very coveted award um, in, it, uh, in its day, in its early, uh, uh, in its early issue by, by the president, by presidential order. And then uh, the second photograph shows the sleeve with the 82nd Airborne All-American insignia. The third photograph shows um, his paratroop uh, wings uh, over uh, an oval, which the oval is indicative of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And if you look at the ribbons on the on our left is uh, the um, uh, um, European Theater uh, of Operations medal, and I have a close up of that because this is where the this is where the the money shot is. When you're in when you're uh, in a campaign, uh, you're awarded a star for that campaign. So uh, you know whatever campaigns your unit is in, you would get a star. So here we see four stars, combat stars. But on the left is a spear tip, an arrowhead. And that is actually, uh, that is actually means that it was a spearhead regiment, one of the very first regiments to uh, go in to a landing or a particular action. So that's, that's a very uh, interesting piece of communication that Sergeant James Shell is wearing on his, uh, on his victory medal. No Purple Hearts, he was never wounded. He has, his other medals are just pretty typical, American campaign, good conduct, and a victory medal. Next, please. Uh, this is um, a soldier. He was an officer. Uh, his name was Herbert Krauss. He um, was not in the very first landing. He arrived uh, hours after, 10 or 12 hours after the first uh, uh, troops had landed and the beach, beach was secured. Um, in fact, he uh, he had a convoy of jeeps that he was uh, using to take supplies further uh, in, inland. And if you notice, he has um, 
These are two of his medals that we have uh, given to us from the family. The left is a purple heart and the right is a silver star. So Herbert Krauss was, uh, was with his troops um, scouting out positions uh, in, in the Jeep, um, trying to get materials to forward lines when they were hit by a German shell. And uh, all his whole, his whole Jeep uh, squad was killed. Krauss lost an eye and um, he was awarded a silver star um, for his part in that, that day's action. Now, um, that was it for him. He, uh, he uh, obviously had to be sent uh, to recover and would not, uh, would not fight through the rest of the war, but his, his D-Day experience lasted only a few days. Next, please. Um, this is uh, a communications book. It's a, it's a, Navy, um, a Navy book that would have been kept in the radio room. Of all the communications that came in to the, uh, to the, to the ship. And if you can see it, I should have copied it. I'm going to have to look very closely. Um, it's this. This is the USS Patan, and the Patan is serving in the Pacific, not in the Atlantic. It did not take part in the D-Day invasion, but um, this communication went out to let this to let the fleet know in the Pacific that a landing had occurred in Europe, and it says General Eisenhower's headquarters announced that Allied troops have landed in. Uh, in the south of France, uh, and it gives the time and um, a few other remarks. But this would have been how this would have been how the uh, the Navy in the Pacific would have been notified that uh, the the war halfway across the world was uh, was taking shape and Europe had been invaded. And with uh, with that going on and the part that they were playing, um, both theaters. Uh, uh, we would eventually um, we would eventually bring an end to the war in 1945. So I think that's all my slides, if I'm correct. Um, I'm going to give it to you, Tim. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate that. So uh, any questions out there, please remember you can type them into a comment section under Facebook or email. If you're watching on YouTube, you can email Soldiers and Sailors Pittsburgh. Uh, at gmail.com. Um, I have one quick question, and I hate to put you guys on the spot. This might be difficult, um, but here in Pittsburgh, uh, as a lot of uh, our viewers, I'm sure, know, we're very proud of our neighborhoods and our towns. Um, do you know exactly where maybe some of these Pittsburgh connections, you know, where they lived, where, where, where their hometown was, aside from Western Pennsylvania? I don't know. Jared, can you speak to any of the, the stories that you told us where they were from? Um, yes, I can. Uh in some of the articles, um, not all of them have a lot of specificity to them, but on occasion they did. And uh, if you just bear with me a moment, I can give you the exact address of uh, one of the gents that I talked about. And so uh, Charles E. Schmelz, um, the stowaway who jumped aboard the, the Normandy bound glider craft, uh, lived at 117 Shady Avenue. And uh, I looked up that address uh, before our presentation tonight to see if uh, it was still standing. And unfortunately, it, it's not. It's a big um, intersection that's been largely paved over. Um, but rest assured, there are many, many houses still out there in the lovely old neighborhoods of Pittsburgh uh, where these guys still lived. And you know, the, the really wild thing about it is uh, I guarantee you probably the majority of people who live in those homes today aren't really, they probably aren't aware of the heroes who once uh, graced their homes. Um, but with uh, wonderful stuff like newspapers.com and newspaperarchives.com, it's so easy anymore to look up your address and to trace who lived there uh, during these bygone eras. So um, for any of you tuning in tonight, uh, and you're, you're curious about your house and who lived there, a subscription to something like newspapers.com is uh, worth its weight in gold. 
And Michael, do, do you have any insight? I know Pinder, we know for sure. Um, do you want to unmute your mic and let us know if uh, any connections to specific hometowns? Yeah, Pinder, we know a lot about. Um, he moved around quite a bit. Um, he was um, he graduated from Butler High School in, in uh, Butler County. Uh, he lived in uh, McKees Rocks for uh, a number of years, and uh, he enlisted from Burkittstown. So he, he kind of is all around Western Pennsylvania. He's buried in Burkittstown with his mother and father. So uh, he does move around uh, quite a bit, uh, real Western Pennsylvanian. Um, and I have to confess, I, I, the only other one I know uh, where he lived, in, and we do have the information on uh, these fellows, and um, next time I'll have to put that in my notes. But I know that um, Swazek lived in, uh, in Oakland. Uh, he lived in South Oakland. Uh, and he was a, a pipe fitter. And, uh, you know, we, when we when we receive these donations from the sons and sometimes grandchildren, we always ask questions, you know, what did they do after the war? Did they ever talk about it? Um, where did they live? And, and sometimes we have, uh, you know, letters that they wrote home, so we'll know their addresses. Um, I just um, didn't put it in my fact sheet here. But, yes, we do know a lot of them. And I would add, too. Mm -hmm. that I think these sorts of stories would make for a wonderful WQED film. Like Rick Seaback needs to get on top of this. And, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, uh, I think a, a Pitts, Pittsburgh and the Civil War would be a, yeah. a great documentary um, as well. There's so many of these hidden histories and stories um, that are in these various neighborhoods. And uh, like so many big cities, when you peel, when you peel back those layers of time, uh, you can find some really compelling stuff. So uh, I put that forth as a challenge mm -hmm. um, to the residents of Pittsburgh um, and, and demand those sorts of shows because they're really worthwhile. Well, we've been, Tim knows this, we've been working on uh, lists of uh, Medal of Honor recipients. And there are, I think, 33 in Allegheny County, which is phenomenal, wow. really. If, if we're a city of champions, we are a county of heroes. Very well put. Uh, I have a question here for Jared. Um, do you have any stories of how um, the African-American veterans were received in Pittsburgh after World War II? Uh, we know that African-Americans rarely receive the GI Bill benefits of college and home purchase assistance. Are they more likely to receive either of these benefits if they were from the North? Yes. Um, and I can't, I can't, I can't offer any uh, specific anecdotes um, in that regard, but Yes. Um, when you look, especially when you look at a lot of the suburbs that started popping up after World War II, both outside Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, um, it was nowhere written in any formal language that these sorts of uh, homes and new communities were segregated. But it was it was an unwritten law um, because, you know, there were these uh, racist assumptions um, the, you know, if you let minorities into these communities, that property values will plummet and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a, a sad reality of the time period. And, uh, you know, it really demonstrated the shortcomings of American exceptionalism in 1940s and 1950s America. And um, as, as the viewer was very accurate in, in assuming, um, those opportunities were even lesser and you know in the deep south um there were many black veterans in the greater pittsburgh area um who if they did not get to go to college uh they at least were able to go to uh technical or vocational schools through the gi bill and gained employment in a lot of uh pittsburgh's many plants and mills um after the war um but yes there was most definitely a keller line and uh, we're in many ways still reeling from the effects of some of that all these years later. Thank you, Jared. Um, I also want to point out, I'm noticing in the comments, um, I want to do a quick shout out to Leanne Zeiss. Uh, she mentions that her uncle was in the 82nd Airborne. And uh, we just recently inducted him into our Hall of Valor this past year. And she mentions that he was from Hatfield Street in Lawrenceville, which is the neighborhood which I live in. So um, that's really cool that she points that out. Thank you so much if you're still watching, Leanne, for, for mentioning that. Uh, let me see here. I think we are. Uh, we have a question of, and I don't know if you guys can do this because we kind of went through the neighborhood you know of. Any Northsiders who played a significant role? Anybody from the north side of, 
of Pittsburgh. I know, um, I believe uh, Kelly was from the north side, but that doesn't relate to D-Day specifically. Is there uh, anybody that you guys think of or, or know of? That might be a tough one, but. Mm, can't think of anybody out of the top of my head. Kelly comes to mind so quickly, but Charles Kelly uh, was a Medal of Honor recipient uh, for his action in Italy in 1943, uh, was a North Sider, but of course he's not at D-Day. Right. I guarantee you there were probably thousands of them. Yes. Uh, I, and, and yeah. so that's uh, another challenge that we can put forth to our viewers. You know, find these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, look up these streets in the old newspapers and you will undoubtedly find the tales. We have a collection of uh, North Side photographs of North Side soldiers. It was, it was, a, it was a photo wall that was put up during the war in a barber shop, and many of them are identified. And we've copied them all. Um, it's our wish someday to put them online so people could, um, you know, look for a family member and and maybe see a photograph they've never seen before. That's great. Well, uh, once again, what an excellent program. I want to thank both of our panelists uh, for joining us this evening and thank everyone who joined us this evening uh, for our Spotlight On pre presentation. Um, Soldiers and Sailors is excited to announce that we are now open again to walk-in visitors. So if you're looking to visit the museum, you can come anytime Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. or our regular hours. That being said, we still are offering guided tours. A lot of people took advantage of the appointment-only guided tours while we were closed to walk-in visitors. And those group tours or guided tours are still available, and you can visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org, to learn more about that. Um, also, if I can pull up our slide here, you can see that uh, you can find information about us at Soldiers and Sailors. And also, as Jared mentioned, you can find Jared Frederick on Facebook, or you can visit jaredfrederick.com. Next month's program will feature um, Spotlight on Gettysburg Treasures of the Collection. We look forward to hosting that program on July 8th, 2021 at 7 p.m. And we hope you will join us for that one. And we look forward to virtually seeing you next, year, uh, next month. So with that, that's going to bring us to the end of the program. Thank you once again to everyone involved. And I uh, hope to see you next time. Take care. Thank you.